when Grandpa came down here, he he wrote his name, Mazare. And they said, you can't have that name. And he said, that is my name. I am, I am a Swiss German. And he said, well, you can't come through. You've got to go over there and we're going to give you a different name. And oh, my grandpa, till his dying day, despised it. And they put Massery, M-A-S-S-E-R-Y. But I had such a great life with my grandparents. They did come over on the same boat. But the strangest thing is both, they were not, one was from uh, Switzerland and one was from Munich, Germany. And both of them were, both of my grandfather's names were Anton, spelled the same way, A-N-T-O-N. And they both bought farms right together, right together. And mother and daddy grew to be friends with them and became in love. And daddy asked her to marry him, and but he wasn't going to get married until he bought a car and a house. He bought a big old touring car. Uh, I don't even know what kind it was. And he bought a house that was brand new, brand new. Nobody had ever lived in it. Brick. Beautiful house, still standing, just as pretty as it ever was in all its days, in uh, Little Rock in on a Tyler Street, twelve ten North Tyler, and uh, so he, but he hadn't gotten mother far enough yet to get married, so Daddy would go pick all those girls up in his truck uh, right wagon, and he would have hot b bricks for mother, and nobody else could sit there. And uh, this was going on, but he wouldn't get married until he had that house sold uh, and paid for, and he did it. And it was about a year, and Daddy uh, came and got his mom, got mother and said, hurry up, hurry up, I've got something to, to show you. It's something that you'll never see before. Uh, before you have never seen before, and I can hardly wait to show it to you. We're going to go out under our tree. They had a tree where they, you know, made their, and I'm going to show it to you. And she thought, oh, he's going to get me a ring. What is it? And she said, he said, well, now you just wait patiently because it's going to be a surprise. You're going to love it. Well, she thought it was a ring. What do you think it was? A danged old pineapple that she'd never, he'd never seen before, nor did she. <laughs> and so she wouldn't eat pineapple for the rest of her life. <laughs> so that was Daddy's love affair with Mother. <laughs> he was such a, a strange man. He was good, and he was bad, and could get so mad. Oh, my goodness, he had a temper. But then he would pull down, and he was great. He was my favorite. I loved my daddy. Oh, gosh. I love mother, too. Mother was good. But she was different. She wasn't outgoing like daddy was. She was so reserved, and she wouldn't put a, anything of herself out. We got to go to Conway. We would go to Grandma's house, Grand Minnie's house, on first, and then we would go to Grandma's house. Daddy drove a Packard. Oh, did he think he was hot stuff? <laughs> it took forever and ever. I thought we'd never get out there, and freezing cold, 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 and. And slow, 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 and we'd be three. We were all, well, there were th four of us. The fa baby stayed in mother's lap, so there were three of us, three little girls in the back seat just fighting all the while, pinching and fussing and carrying on. <laughs> but then every time you went up there, you might expect to be pulled out. Of, and we couldn't get out of the car. Mother and Daddy would get Mother stayed in, and Daddy had to get out to help him with the horse. To get, they'd had men on the 
just yeah, waiting out in the fields on Sunday because they knew they were going to have lots of company and they were ready. They'd have to pull their cars out of the ditches so we could go on home. And I don't even know how many, <clears throat> how many they would put at a time, but they always had somebody pulling somebody out of the ditch. Bad, bad roads. And you might get one that made a little too big of a puddle and you'd get smashed, slop all over the windshield. And it was a mess. It really was a mess. But when we got to Conway, where my grandmother was, both of them were on German Lane. Now you've heard of that. It's one of the main streets up there now. And that's where they all lived. All the whole bunch of them uh, settled there. Even my other grandmother settled there. And Grandma's house was real pretty. This man was a carpenter, this Anton. And he was very smart and very uh, gifted. He could build anything. Looked so, he could, they had the prettiest house. It was just a mansion like what we we would call big old house with this spiral stairway and they even had an organ and they were quite affluent. And um, we would eat their dinner. She had these cookies that she'd bake about that big and uh, everything good. And uh, the house was just different. They're just completely different. These were German people. The food was excellent, and the fun was there, and the men played croquet. And did they ever have games? The men, only the men, they were they were out in the chicken yard, <laughs> and they'd have to take their shoes off when they came in because they were in the chicken yard. I never will forget that. And my grandpa made brooms, <clears throat> and at Christmas time, Every daughter he had and every granddaughter he had got a little bitty broom and the others got the big ones. And we went, would go in there and play like we were. <laughs> He'd get so mad at us. We, the, uh, some of the boys in the, in the, in the group, would, we'd go in there and play like we were killing each other. Wasn't that silly? And there was a thing that turned around and we just play like we were putting him to sleep. <laughs> God, dog, of all things we did, it was just terrible. They were, it was on a Sunday, and it was a big flood of, of uh, Little Rock. I don't know, don't remember what time it was or anything like that, but uh, mother was in labor, not really labor, but she got lab into labor. She was bored and daddy was bored and he said, what can we do? And she said, why don't we just go look at the heavy waters they've got and see how it looks. So they went to the bank and luckily there comes this chicken coop with a little doggy on the top of it, just barking, begging to get out off. And daddy somehow got a stick from in on the ground and lured that thing to the and got it and mama grabbed it and she said it's mine it's mine i'm going to keep it let's go home by the time we came home i was having a baby and so was the doggy the doggy was having a puppy and we lived to have that dog he was just a part of our family and Every time the dog catcher came, we ran away and hid it under the sink so we wouldn't get it. Because Daddy said, if you ever have to make me go get that thing from the pound, you'll never keep it. So we had to run and we had to hide him, hide her. Trixie, that was her name. That's what we named her. <clears throat> and uh, she, we lived just a few blocks from school, right there, 1210, over on Harrison Street is where we were raised. And I went to Mount St. Mary's, so did all my sisters. And it was to the top of the hill. And our house went up and up on top of the hill, and then the school went down the hill. 
And that little dog, every single day at three o'clock, school let out. No matter what mama was doing, if mother was feeding her, or if she was whatever, she would go to that hill and wait till we came home. And she walked us home every day. We had her for, she was way up into 14 or 15 years old. And a big old dog came and she got in heat and a big old dog came and tore to pieces. It was very sad, but it taught us how to love dogs. <laughs> we were dog people. My house, m mother and daddy bought a house. Now you might not believe this, but it is true. Daddy was uh, was uh, working for his brothers at a big, huge laundry downtown, and it was just before the war, and his bro brothers were not treating him right, and he got angry and he got upset, and he decided that he was going out on his own, and he bought this grocery store, and he did. He bought it. What do you think? That was the day that Pearl Harbor dropped the bomb, and Daddy had already put down his, and couldn't get out of it. He didn't know beans about a grocery store, nor did Mother. Mother never had worked a day in her life. It had the upstairs, uh, it was big, very big, that was for the family, family owned. And that's what it was called, a family owned grocery store. And uh, Daddy went out and solicited homes that he knew of through the family that would like to have their uh, groceries delivered to their home. So we he just did real well doing that. And for about a year, I guess, we managed. Uh, and our butcher got called to service. And he we lost him. And that really put us in a bind. But Daddy was very fortunate and found a... a person that could fill in or was a butcher. So that daddy thought he was going to lose the laundry. Mother got in there and she took over her part and we would fill the orders for the, the girl and I and then we'd load, load them or the butcher would, the old man butcher would load them for us and we'd go out and take them and they'd come pick it up. We did that for about a couple of years and uh, helped mother and daddy out of a bad bind because they were really into it. People would take the groceries out. They wouldn't let us carry them in. And then they would give us our our stamps, our little bitty ration stamps. They were no bigger than a baby finger, the ration stamps that they went in, in right away. And uh, we had to check, count them. Mother would, would tell us how much we had to do. It was exactly like the money. Now, the, everything else was paid for by uh, checks. But the stamps, we had to get them or else we couldn't leave the groceries. And my sister and I, and they never did argue with them. They gave us the stamps. And that was really hard for us. We didn't know what we were doing. The little kids, two little girls that didn't know what we were doing. And then we would go to the safe. And we, we, my sister was a rascal. She was a little bit younger than I was. And she would uh, sneak a package of cigarettes. And we would take that, and I would sneak a bottle of orange juice, two, two bottles of orange juice. And we would go to the truck, just da 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 And she had the cigarettes and I had the orange juice. And we'd go down in a little park and have our little treat every time. Mother and Daddy never knew that we were swiping cigarettes. And they were on the list. You could get any amount of money you wanted out of a package of cigarettes. The store was on Kavanaugh Boulevard. And right beside it was an or a very large, uh, the store, the house that was real tall that where we stayed, you know, cause the, and then there had, they had this house of ill repute, I guess you call it. <laughs> I don't know what else you could call it. And we, 
were wondering her name was Kitty. And she was so pretty. And we'd see her and she'd come in and we'd just laugh. And she knew it. She'd buy her cigarettes and her, we didn't sell any alcohol of any kind, but she, but she was just, didn't think anything of it. Then she'd go home and she'd have company and we would watch out our windows and we could see him. And one night, Daddy, oh, Daddy was just fussing about us not doing that. We wouldn't, we shouldn't do that. And Daddy saw Kitty go up and go in the back. Yeah, we could just see everything. It, she didn't take any, and she knew it. I believe she helped, thought we helped her get her man. I don't know what to do. That was terrible. She was the prettiest thing, but she sure was a rascal. She had men come in there. They'd be in the whole room just to smoking away, just to smoking, 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 <laughs> waiting their turn <laughs> to go down the side stairs. It was very bad. Mother and Daddy got all over us. We couldn't do that anymore. <laughs> but when we first found out about it, it was so funny. Daddy had a friend who, uh, whose sister was getting married to his brother. So he told us we could go to that, that uh, Italian wedding and get that. That's the first time I ever tasted that good food. And uh, there was two little boys, and my sister was old enough to be. And they, we'd t call them and call them, and they'd run like hell. They'd stack it like they were petrified. They were scared to death. And Pete said they were trying to get us in the bushes. <laughs> Bad old thing. <laughs> and uh, that was that was my, my uncle and his, my husband's, and Pete, my husband's sister that got married there on that, on that day. And I never thought anything more about that kid. I mean, he, I just thought he was a kid. And then about, oh, several months passed and the boys were scarce. The, everybody was in the service and you didn't have a very many people to date. And uh, one of my friends called and said her boyfriend had a friend that needed a, would I like to go? And I said, well, I don't know, well, who is it? And she said, I don't know his name, but would you want to go with us? And I said, yeah, I'll go. Well, here we come. He comes to the door and he said, is your name really Massery? And I said, yes, it is. And he said, well, that's who my sister just married somebody named Massery. But I looked at him and I thought he didn't have a this tooth was out. He had knocked it out with a with a tire tool, and I just thought, well, for crying out loud, I where I got to fool with this thing tonight, and I didn't care about him at all, and I'm pretty sure he felt the same way about me, but that mother of mine was out there. Pray, praying to the angel that I would marry somebody like him because she knew that family. <laughs> she knew I'd have a good husband, and I swear to goodness if he wasn't the best. And uh, I had chances to meet, go with other boys. I just couldn't do it. I mean, you talk about things falling from heaven. I could just think about that little boy, but he was so funny looking without that tooth and and just real country, real country. And I just couldn't get over him. But his sister would send him mail and say that I wrote and said she he ought to write to me. Well, then I would write back to him and then he would think that I was just playing alone. But he had a girl on the string. And I did not know that. And so uh, he didn't like her. He, did, he really didn't like her. But it just kept going on that way. And pretty soon, the more I think I didn't want him, the more I wanted him. And he the same. My wonderful 
Roman sweetheart. That's how I would write to him on his letters. He would write me back and he would say, I signed this with a kiss. And he'd have a great big old kiss <laughs> on his letters. <laughs> but from the time that I started writing him until the time he came home, which was a good year, I, we fell in love and really and truly we, he came home and told, wrote, called me on the phone and said, don't, don't tell my sister, don't tell anybody, just you, meet me, and we will see each other. And that's it. I knew that we wanted to get married. In fact, he proposed about three hours after he got home, three or four hours after he got home, if we could get married. And I said, well, I don't know how we will do it. And he said, we'll find a way, we'll find a way. Well, somebody, daddy, daddy came. Somebody said, you know, I just think it's so weird. Uh, it was one of daddy's working friends down at the laundry. He was back at the laundry. He said, why didn't you put Dorothy's and Pete's name in the paper? It's not in the paper. They're not there. It's not there. And he said, what are you talking about? Daddy even said that. I said, well, don't you know that tomorrow is, is uh, President's Days or something like that? They got to have a marriage license. Have you not sent them? And they're not going to get married till they have a marriage license. And Daddy said, you mean to tell me I'm going to see right now? And he called Mama and said, damn, he said, we're in a pickle. He said, those kids don't have a marriage license. And Pete was working there at the time. And he said, boy, get your butt home. Get Dorothy and get yourself as fast as you can up to Conway because your mama has to sign your marriage license because you're too young. And man, we took that daddy's fishing car and it just was a little old bitty coop and it bagged. God, we flew up there. I thought he'd surely wreck. I, you know, he still wasn't a good driver yet because he was just back from the Navy. <laughs> I mean, it was about a month and a half since he'd been home from the Navy. And uh, we, we got there and it was closed. And Pete said, I'm sorry, what are we gonna do? And I said, I don't know. Let's call up Daddy. And Daddy called one of the judges. The judge that Daddy knew real well was kind enough to sign it. Then what did we do? After when we got married, we left it in the church. <laughs> they went to bring it back. They had called Daddy and said, you better come get this marriage license before something happens to it. Uh, there I was, all bloused out in my gown, in my wedding gown, and there's my little sweet Pete. That he was just out of the navy. I mean, he was just hung home from the navy, and all his bridegrooms were there, down at the bottom of Cathedral Church, waiting for me. And the music started, and it was Daddy, and I. He got my arm, and he wouldn't turn loose my arm. And he held on to my, I said, Daddy, let go, I've got to go, I've got to go. We got about halfway down and he said, stop, don't take another step. And I said, Daddy, let go, I've got to go to Pete. And he said, you stay right here. And he reached, he, in the church, in that big old church, he said, and that young boy, that Pete was so not edu you know, he was just a kid, like. And Pete said, just as loud as he could say it, if you want her, you come and get her. <laughs> and I just about dropped dead in, right there in the tracks. And uh, of course it was all right. He, he, Daddy just worshiped Pete. And that's the way it turned out.
Pete came right up, all the way up, halfway up the church, and got me. Daddy let go of that. But the mother was so mad at him. Mother didn't talk to him for two weeks. <laughs> he would always embarrass her. She would say, he embarrasses me. But he, it was just his way. My mother and my father got married, but they didn't get along, and they fussed all their lives. But they never did separate or anything, but they just didn't be good for each other. And Pete and I never did have a fuss. We just didn't do it. He'd say, oh, I got a wife, and all she does is talk, 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 talk. <laughs> then he'd say, why are you so quiet? <laughs> The first time we ever went to the Center Ridge, Pete took me to see his parents, his mother, his daddy had been long gone. And so uh, they had a big old long table, long, long table, and then a whole bunch of kids, but the kids couldn't eat, just the grown ups could eat. And um, they set the table and they let all the men in the house, which was a bunch of them, all the men to sit in, and Pete sat down, and I went, and he said, come on, Dorothy, and I went and sat beside him, and you know that woman made me get up, that women didn't get to, to eat until the men had eat, all eaten. That was her hard, she never one time ever would ever come to our house to stay. She was so backward. But that I was just mortified when that happened. I couldn't even sit by my Roman man that I was so crazy about. She wouldn't even let me sit by him. <laughs> she was very rigid. She wouldn't let our, any of our kids eat till everybody else had eaten, except to mine, because she knew I'd fuss. She took mine to the pantry and fed them. <laughs> But she was a good old soul. She didn't know what she was doing. She's just a country lady, little old country lady. Somehow, he got, Daddy got him a job at the laundry, at that laundry. And I was working real, I was making good money. And uh, Daddy found a little house. Daddy was so good to us. And that's one thing, my mother resented him giving me, Pete, and I so much attention, which I guess maybe she needed to, I don't know. Mother liked Pete, too. She loved him, but she got jealous that Daddy would give to Pete when he wouldn't give her a new house. And it was new, brand new, little bitty house in Levy, Arkansas, little old bitty house. But we were so tickled because you couldn't even rent an apartment. You couldn't rent a uh, nothing. There was nothing available. We couldn't buy a car. We had he had saved a whole bunch of money, and I had plenty. But we didn't even couldn't even buy a car. And finally, we found a car to buy, which was great. We were tickled to death to get that through Pete's sister. That's the only way we got it. Then Daddy bought that little house for us, and we were doing just fine with that little house until we got into it and it didn't have a bathtub. So we started trying to find a where to buy a bathroom. They said, there are none. You can't find a house. There were building houses everywhere. Anyway, we stayed there for a little while and we had to go across the street to a sister's house to get a bath. And we could not get a telephone. They were impossible to get. And at the time, we didn't have our car yet either. And I was not at all used to that because mother and daddy had a car at my, whenever I wanted it. And uh, so daddy knew that we didn't like it. So he uh, sold it and uh, got us a rent house. So that's what we started out with. Then we finally found a house that was being built that we got to raise our children in, our first children. We had three children and 
two ha two bedroom house, <laughs> but we made it just fine. Johnny had uh, one of the babies, and Sammy had a little bed, and we had our bed, and we did all right with it. It was okay, and then we finally got to get a bigger house, so and a brand new house. They started getting more and more out. You know, it was terrible. That was the after the war. You couldn't even. If you had a million dollars, it wouldn't do you any good <laughs> if you didn't have the right way to do it. But that was not any fun. But as I said, Daddy helped us all the time. And Pete adored Daddy. My Daddy would literally, uh, he was quite a man. I loved that man. God, he was a good man. He was funny, he was mean, he could get so mad, yet he was so good to everybody. Um, he uh, would put a tailor top, and Daddy had this old stupid hound dog that he called Nick or some crazy name. And he'd tie a rope to that thing, to the handle of that, and take that baby out walking with that rope. <laughs> and I'd get mad at him. I mean, I did not want him to do that. Do you think I could talk him out of it? He just said, that's half my baby. He said, that's my baby. That was Johnny. He he idolized Johnny. He He just thought Johnny was his. The day that he was born, the day that Johnny was born, Daddy put himself a whole ugly hat on and had a walking cane, and he put an overcoat on, and he acted like he was old old man, and he came to work like that. Everybody said, what in the world are you doing? Well, I got to be a grandpa. I had a son. <laughs> he was so tickled. <laughs> He was so happy to have that boy. We were just having boys and boys, and both of us would be so completely upset about it. I wanted a girl all the while, and the first one was Johnny. He was a boy, and then came the next one. He was a boy, and then the third one came, and the doctor knew how bad we wanted this little baby girl. But I was not showing much, you know, I mean, I'm just really talking now, but just a little bitty thing here. And uh, the doctor said, you've got plenty of time, Mr. Palladino. She's not going to deliver yet. You can go have, get your dinner. And Pete said, okay, I'll go. And so he went down to uh, get his dinner and the baby came and it was a little girl. And he came out of the, he would, wouldn't even do his work. She was all right and everything was okay. When the peep came back, he wouldn't tell anybody. He said, don't tell him what I got. Don't tell him what's here. Don't tell him what's here. He took her and put her in a pink, little pink thing and did like this sugar, the little towel and showed Daddy Pete. It was pink and Pete just cried like a baby. We were so tickled to finally get us one little girl. We used to make uh, plays. We would have a play. Mother and Daddy just enjoyed these kids. They loved them, and they, they loved to come to see the plays. And so we would make them, and the kids would all help me. And Pete didn't care much about helping, but he liked to watch. He'd sit there. He was so tired all the time. He had to work so hard. And um, he would he would sit there and tell them what they were doing wrong. And then mother and daddy would come and with big old steaks and a great big cake and all of that stuff, and they'd have to see the play. And they would always do one, fix, fix them up. It was a good life. My husband and I, we worked hard. We had a dry cleaning and laundry business. And it was very time consuming and hard to keep help. 
he would uh, call for me to come and I'd have to leave the children at home. And the boys, those bad, bad boys, got Karen, which was a, the only girl in the family, which we prayed and prayed and prayed to get a girl and finally got her. They uh, got the sister and, and I told them to take care of Karen. But they weren't good to her, but she never told on them. But they would be make her sit with her feet up like this and tacks under them, so she didn't call her tack up and oh, all the bad things they used to do to her, just little, little crap, crazy things. She did not like them. She did not like them. So it came time to write a poem at school. And she. this is what she wrote. My brothers, of these monsters, I have three. Why, oh why, did it happen to me? Football, baseball, basketball, all the rest of it, she had to live through without a baby sister. <laughs> she cried when when the last one was born. She didn't have a baby sister. She was, she was so upset. She never did. I don't think she ever got over it. <laughs> Whenever a Karen was a, just in the third grade or about like that when I was going to have that last baby, and she was going to, just knew it was going to be a sister. It was going to be her little baby sister, going to be her baby sister. And they would, everybody would say, well, it might not be. It's going to be a baby sister. And Mama said, well, I tell you what, you just, just, you can pick the name. We'll let you pick the name. And she said, well, okay. Then, now she had a friend whose name was Baxter, mm -hmm. Becky Baxter. She said, well, we're going to name this baby Bastard. <laughs> and she said, I could have a little baby Bastard. <laughs> and she knew that for her. She was not very big. And she that was her, her way of going to tell everybody what she had. She never did get over it. She really didn't. <laughs> she wanted a baby sister. One Sunday, when Pete was very, very tired, and he was sitting in his chair, and he was trying to read the paper, and the boys were hacking, aggravating him for a, to go down to the lumber yard and get him a, a backdrop, and he's he just said, go on now, don't bother me, I'm tired. And he'd go back to sleep. And this went on, and I didn't notice that he was so tired. And uh, all of a sudden, I noticed that the baby, the little small young child, was gone. And so was the dog. And I looked out the window, and here they come up. The baby's pants were undone. You know how they don't button up. And he was wet, and the dog was running away from him, trying to get him to come home. And uh, the kids came running, and they said, Mama, Mama, the police, police got my Johnny and Sammy. Police got Johnny and Sammy. <laughs> and I said, the what? And the cops picked him up, Some <laughs> somebody called. The a lady around there told the policemen to come that they were robbing the lumber yard. There were two boys spot robbing the lumber yard. And I went running down there. They were about a half a block down this block. And I said, do you have my boys in that car? And they looked kind of sheepish. And I said, you let those car those kids out of there right now. Do you honestly think that I would let a child go down with a diaper undone and a dog without a leash and two little babies. They just sneaked away from me for a minute. Now don't you dare tell them. And they, boy, they were bling, 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 and they were gone. <laughs> Never saw them again. And they came in the house and they said, boy, they didn't get us. They didn't get us. <laughs> Daddy said, but I'm going to get you right now. And he whipped them something fierce and Poor things, never forgot it. I felt sorry for them. But they didn't go around that place anymore. 
And every day of the world, when but when they were all the same age, the whole neighborhood would come and play on the Paladino's baseball thing. Pete had his regular baseball thing fixed up for him. The people would come and watch the ball game, and they would play. Oh gosh, they it was they were just it was just a good life all together. We had a nice garage in our house that we had put up the corner about like that over there to over there with a food uh, shop, food thing. We bought our meat, beef, and pork. You had to have the pork and the beef. And a plenty of uh, garlic. I don't know how much because he always did it. It was him. And we put that in the pot. And we put it in a big old wash tub. We, he'd get like 60 pounds of beef and maybe 40 pounds of pork. Because if you didn't put the pork in it, it wouldn't have the, it wouldn't be, it would be, you know, it wouldn't stay together. So he had to put the pork in it. So I had to stay there. And this thing was, this grinder was up. We had to go to every thrift store in the world before we found it. And you, it had a rank, crank on it. And you get the insides, guts, from the uh, hogs, hogs meat shop there on the boulevard. And uh, he would get all that meat and a brand new tub, it wasn't ever used, big, great big. And the whole bunch, I don't have any idea how much garlic he put in it, or season, or salt, or pepper. But it always tasted like something you never had before. He he would uh, put that all together and mix it with his hands. He had gloves up to here, and he would mix it, and then he would uh, have it ready it to go in that thing, in that big old grinder. And it would come out of the spout about that big, and you'd put on the skin like that, you know? And then you, it, it would come through the skin and out like this and get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. <laughs> the kids just would say, Mama! <laughs> but we'll pass on that, that work because <laughs> they sure did eat it. <laughs> anyway, then you would take them and you would hang them on a rod that of his smokehouse, which Johnny built for us, he had to, <laughs> which we were real proud of it, and it was really going good. We took that 60 pounds of beef and about 30 pounds of pork. It was at least 100 pounds of, of meat. And put that in in there and started uh, grinding it and we did it got it all fixed and all hung up and on the rods that in the little smokehouse it was just a nice little house and it he put a big tub one of the iron tubs in the ground so that it would hold the sausage if it would fall but doggone it, one time, one night, somebody was knocking on the door and the doorbell was ringing and they said, your house is on fire, your house is on fire. And I got up and Pete was already sound asleep. He got up, that blaze was going like you can't imagine, you just can't imagine burned up a beautiful fence that he had put up. This was a brand new house that we had put, and burned our fence up with a whole bunch of the, the meat 
all of it. Well, you couldn't use it. And when the fire truck came, they begged us to let us pick, let them pick through there so they could find some. <laughs> Maybe they could get one or two little pieces out of it. <laughs> that was terrible. Oh, that was about the last last time we made sausage. It was a job. Everybody I know would beg us for that sausage, and we just tell them we just can't do it. It it's just our little thing, and it's too hard. We just unless it was somebody very special, we didn't try to do anything with it because with they the kids that's all they wanted was sausage. One time we had we were already living up there, and Pete wanted to make it wine. He he did make wine. He made delicious wine, and uh, muscadine wine. And uh, we had the truck, and we were going up to get the, find the muscadines, and you could smell them if you knew how to smell them. So yeah, he found them, parked the truck, and we got out and started finding where they were. And there was a whole clump of them, and it was like a over, like a, a tent of that old stuff that it grows and just piled over the top of it. And so Pete said, and started to drizzle a little bit. And Pete said, oh, good heavens, it's gonna rain on us. Let's just play like we're two deer. Let's just get in this hut and sit down here. And after it's over with, we'll get those muscadines. So we sat in there and all of a sudden, my God, we were making love. We were really at it. And uh, the dead gun things caught fire. It, I said, we burning up the place. <laughs> so and that was it. But the best part of our life was the very last part when we, he was, Pete was getting so tired. And he just, his, he was just wearing himself to death. And uh, he, he was, we had this great big house, and we had another log house up at the lake. He was uh, sitting there one day, and he said, he was, he did a lot of figuring all the time, joshing with the pencil and writing here and writing there, and I never did realize what he was doing. And uh, he would add up and subtract and do all that. And how much is so-and-so? You know, but I didn't know what he was doing. And finally he said, because I love that old house. We raised our kids in it practically. And uh, finally, and he said, Dorothy, I've got a man that wants to buy our place, the cleaners. It's my time to have life and get have some living. I would love to go to the lake and live there, but I want you to pick it. You pick the lake house or this one. We there was a nice one. It was a log house. Or you or you can have this one. Which one you pick, but we cannot retire and have a, two houses. He said, "Just which one do you want?" So I looked at him and I saw how pleading he was. He really was worn out, just totally worn out. And uh, I said, the log house, and he jumped a mile. <laughs> he gave me the biggest kiss I guess he ever gave me. And we moved up to the lake, he and I, and sold that house at home. And we never regretted it, We it was just heaven on earth to be free. Pete would go out and find a place that he looked like maybe would be a little drip dip in the land. And so he would get a root and put it in there so that you that would be the wire, a root, regular root, and he'd fix it where it would stay. You had to go through the root and then you had to go up on a Greer's Ferry rock. You know, those were big rocks. 
You had to get the ball inside of the rock. It had all kinds of things that he would do. And at the time, my dear was standing out there with three legs, which those kids all teased about mama and her dear with three legs. All one day we were going to church and there stood that poor old deer and he didn't have but three legs, two front ones and one back one. And I, Pete, Pete, please get me that. My birthday's coming up. Please, I want that deer. I want that deer, please, please. And he said, and I'm not going to get that silly old deer. That's just hush. I don't want to hear about it. So we went on to church and we came out of church and I said, Pete, please, I want that deer so bad I can't stand it. He said, what the heck would you do with that thing? And I said, I want it. He, I said, you can fix it in the garden. There's a low, a high spot that had moss all over it, right in the front yard, right not at the, at the, at the road. And he said, we can't. How, how did you expect me to pick that thing up? It's too heavy, first of all. And the man that owned the place, I guess, came out there looking at what we were doing out there. And I said, I'd like to have that deer, but he won't buy it for me. And he said, Pete said, I can't buy it for you because I can't get it at home, to home. I don't have a truck and I don't have any way to get it. And the man said, you really want that deer, don't you? And I said, oh, gosh, I want that deer so bad. I'd give him a good home if you'd just let me have it. <laughs> so he sold it to us for the delivery of the deer. <laughs> and it was my birthday. And he said, and the rest of it would be your birthday presents. And I forgot all about it. And our, our uh, son-in-law went and put a live deer horn that had just been, sh and we found five deer around that, uh, that one, one night. I'm a Christian, a Catholic. One day, I was probably six or eight, and uh, we were in the house, and my younger sisters were chasing me, trying to get something from me, and I was running from them. And they pushed me somehow and made me fall down. And I hurt myself. And and I looked, and there stood a man or a woman, I don't know which it was, in a white garment covered over and didn't say a word but picked me right up off the floor, patted me, and disappeared. All my life, from here on, when I saw, hurt myself, in, just like just now, I, I said, Jesus, I can't, he, he won't let me hurt myself. And that's the truth. So I firmly and truthfully believe in the Lord, and I'm not trying to be uh, somebody that would talk hard and ugly and I just I have a lot of time to go in fact I was seen yesterday by uh, the doctor and he took blood again from my arm and uh, he told me that I was going to live to be 200 not 100 and he said that <laughs> that I was in such perfect health and that I should stay there and hush up and go up and tell everybody hello and speak to them and just pet them and just give them that old smile you got. And he said, you're going to make it, Miss Palladino. You're going for 200 just as sure as you're going for 100. And he left. He said, I'll see you next time. <laughs> so that's what he tells me. And I don't want to. I'm ready to go up to heaven. But he, Jesus won't come get me. I keep saying, come and get me, but he doesn't do it. <laughs> I told him that I don't ever grieve for me because afterward, because I can pray for you and do a whole lot more for you up there than I can down here. So 
But Jesus isn't ready, so I'll have to wait. So, yeah, it was a great life. I really and truly mean it. It was a great life. 